and welcome back for another edition of Safe and Sound. I'm your host, Doug Bolnick, from the St. Charles County Department of Community Health and the Environment. On today's program, we're discovering more ways our community can help make our lives better. We often talk with our families about what to do when we hear tornado sirens or when we receive weather alerts. But have you considered what to do and where to go when you're at work? Ina mccain Obenlin from St. Charles County's Division of Emergency Management will offer suggestions. Next, a bright smile is often the first thing you see when greeting a friend or loved one. I'll visit with Pam Smalley from Crider Health Center about ways to keep your teeth healthy and strong. Many visit tanning salons to keep a bronze glow throughout the year, but who checks on these facilities to make sure they operate safely? Division of Environmental Health and Protection Director Ryan Tilley will show us what his staff inspects when certifying St. Charles County's establishments. After that, Katina O'Leary from Health Literacy Missouri joins me to discuss why it's crucial to truly understand what your doctor tells you during your examination. And we'll end the show with a visit to one of the area's popular dog parks to learn how common etiquette and simple rules make it fun for everyone. But first, Amy Heckert from the City of St. Peter's will explain loans and subsidies available to help qualifying residents improve their homes and properties. Amy, welcome to Safe and Sound. Thank you. What programs does St. Charles County have to offer for people that need help with their homes and properties? St. Charles County has three different housing programs that they provide as well as a transportation program. So what are some of these programs and who might be interested in them? The largest program that the county offers is a five-year, 0% interest forgivable loan called the Urban County Home Improvement Loan Program, and it provides up to $5,000 towards home improvements such as windows, siding, uh, roof, new concrete work, furnace and air conditioning. Um, the homeowner borrows the money now, and as long as they continue to live in and maintain the property for five years, it's automatically forgiven. So it becomes free money or a grant after that five-year period. The second program that the county offers is an emergency repair program, and just like the home improvement program, it provides up to $5,000 as a 0% interest five-year forgivable loan for emergency repairs such as sewer line, septic repairs, water line, as well as emergency furnace and air conditioning uh, repairs or replacements. Um, again, it is forgivable after the five years, assuming that the homeowner continues to live in and maintain the property. Um, finally, the county offers a property maintenance program, and it's a little bit different. It provides up to $2,500 as a grant for homeowners who have existing property maintenance violations. Um, they've actually been cited by the county or one of the participating jurisdictions with a property maintenance violation. So it allows them to have that funding to make those needed repairs. Um, finally, the county offers a transportation program um, for residents who qualify based on age, disability, or income. Um, if they're at least 62, they can qualify based on age, or they can show proof of disability, or we look at a household income. And it provides transportation, it is limited transportation, but provides transportation for medical appointments, grocery shopping, and essential services such as the bank, the pharmacy, the post office. Um, it, and OATS provides that service for the county. And how are these programs funded? The programs are funded through a community development block grant. The county receives the money and develops these programs for low-income families. And when are these applications completed and, and where could someone get some information about them? Um, the applications are dependent on each program. Um, the Several of the programs have a rolling application process, so we accept applications until they're filled or all the program funding is completed. Um, some of the programs are time uh, sensitive, um, so I would recommend that everybody go to the St. Charles County website at www.sccmo.org to view those programs and what those time frames are. And what should people have in hand to, or, to help them complete the forms? Um, most of the programs are, like I said, income-based, um, so they would need to have their most recent taxes. Uh, in some cases, they need to have proof of current income, um, all of their W-2 information. For the housing programs, they do have to have lived in the house for at least a year, and they need to provide us with a copy of a general warranty deed showing ownership. And you mentioned the website, but is there a phone number that people could call for more information? Sure. If people would like to request an application be mailed to them, they can contact the City of St. Peter's at 636-477-6600, and they'll dial extension 1365. Thanks so much, Amy, for this information. Thank you. One situation where emergency home repairs may be needed is after the destruction caused by a tornado. 
To offer suggestions for protecting yourself during a severe storm, let's hear from Ina mccain Obenlin from St. Charles County's Division of Emergency Management. Here in the Midwest, weather changes frequently, very quickly. And most of us are very used to following the weather and following weather forecasts. It's very important to understand the terms that you hear in those forecasts, like severe weather, severe thunderstorm, watch or warning. And one of the things we want people to be aware of is that when we say a severe thunderstorm, we mean something very specific. That type of storm has specific characteristics. And one of the characteristics of a severe thunderstorm is that they can produce a tornado at any time. The difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning um, is small, but it's really important. Um, what we expect people to do and what we want people to do when a watch is issued, that's basically asking residents to just be more aware of what's going on around them and to pay closer attention to weather reports and status updates. What a watch means is that all of the conditions are present for severe weather to happen, but it just may not be happening yet. What a warning means is that somewhere something is actually happening or about to happen very quickly. At that point, when you see a warning, what we want people to do is go ahead and act. The time to prepare, check your home, check for where you would go and having your supplies is during the, the time when the watch is issued. There are a lot of different methods that are used to get the word out to the public as quickly as possible from broadcast media, television, radio, text alerts, phone apps that you can download, National Weather Service weather radio, outdoor warning sirens. We receive a lot of inquiries from residents asking why they can't hear the warning sirens inside their homes. And that's a common misconception. Uh, actually, in reality, outdoor warning sirens were designed to warn people who are outside of the home away from other sources of information that there is an emergency in the area. So they're not actually designed to be heard inside of the home. That's why we strongly recommend that people have NOAA weather radios, that they have apps on their phones or that they monitor the television so they can get these alerts when they're inside the homes. We can't really stress enough how important it is for residents to have more than one source of warning and information in emergencies. Any one of these systems uh, that we've named can experience difficulties or interference at any time. Most people who've lived in this area of the country are familiar with um, what to look for in a refuge area in their homes, and it's very similar in a business setting. But there are some important differences because those buildings are normally designed to hold larger numbers of people. So you have more public areas, larger rooms. What you're still looking for though is the small room on an interior of the building with no windows if possible. If that's not possible, then at least with very few or small windows. Some examples in a business setting might be restrooms, meeting rooms, small conference rooms, interior stairwells, those types of places that still offer more safety away from the exterior areas of the building are exactly what you're looking for in a business setting. You also want to look for an area that's on a lower level. Basement's best, but if that's not available, then you want to place it on a lower level. If you're in an area that's unfamiliar to you, some general rules that you can follow would be moving inward and downward, down to the lowest level and inward away from the exterior walls that way you're putting as many walls as you possibly can between yourself and the hazard outside. In a business setting also, you have to be aware of the safety of your clients or guests. In addition to the staff that works there and is familiar with the building, you're quite likely to have people that are completely unfamiliar with the area. They'll also need guidance on where to go to take refuge. For more information about tornado safety and recommendations on what to do, you can visit our website or you can call our office at 636-949-3023. Our website also has links to Missouri StormAware for additional information as well as FEMA'sReady.gov. Thanks, Ina. Knowing what to do and where to go before a storm hits can be a lifesaver. Stay tuned after this break to learn about other programs that help our community. Bethany Ann Doak. <laughs> Ian Donnelly. Kirsty Lynn Dudhit. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. 
Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know wherever you are. Jimmy can't sing. And Tommy can't dance. So we're, we're going to put, put some ants in their pants. Aww. Kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the Super Duper Party Troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants, they've got ants in their pants. They've got ants in their pants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs, just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover keytar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff. Create jobs. Welcome back to this edition of Safe and Sound, where we're learning about programs that are making St. Charles County better. In addition to being attractive, a bright smile can improve your health. Senior Director of Dental Operations for Kreider Health Center, Pam Smalley, joins me next to explain why. Pam, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me, Doug. Other than a pretty smile, why is dental health important? Well, your mouth is really connected to your entire body. So when you have infection in your teeth or your gums, it can really, um, create havoc for the rest of your system. It's linked to heart disease, diabetes, preterm labor. Um, healthy and pretty smile creates good self-esteem and really um, function. You want to be able to eat and eat healthy foods like vegetables and fruits. What would be some basic tips you would say to keep good dental health? Well, um, most important, brush twice a day, floss once a day, see your dentist two times a year, because you need regular cleaning and children need regular fluoride treatment. Um, children also need to drink fluoridated water and get um, sealants when their permanent teeth come in. And you mentioned brushing twice a day and flossing. Is there a suggested technique or some tips to follow? Well, um, when children are little, they need parents to help them out. But when they get old enough, um, you can start using fluoride toothpaste when they're old enough to spit a small pea size amount on the toothbrush. Angle that toothbrush at a 45 degree angle and then um, help your child floss. And as an adult, you can show your child um, the importance of good oral hygiene by practicing that yourself. So when should someone start caring about their teeth? Well, really, they should start caring about them as soon as they come in. And then the recommended age for your first visit is now one years old because we do um, put fluoride varnish on their teeth when they're young and continue to do that to prevent decay. And some people think that baby teeth aren't important, that they're just going to lose them, but really you have some of those teeth until you're 12 or 13. So you need those teeth to be able to chew and eat healthy foods and also to hold the space for your permanent teeth that could prevent some orthodontic needs in the future. So you did mention that keeping your baby teeth is important. What are some suggestions you'd have for that? Well, it's really important that we limit the amount of sugars that are on the baby teeth on a continual basis. And um, we definitely don't wanna put babies to bed with bottles unless there's water. Um, putting babies to bed with bottles that have milk or juice is very detrimental to your teeth. 
letting your kids walk around with a sippy cup all day with juice drinks and juice and milk um, continually bathes those teeth with sugar and that, that is also very harmful to the teeth. In addition to taking care of yourself, you also mentioned going to a dentist. Mm -hmm. For those that may not be experienced with dentists, what would it be a typical first visit, typical subsequent visit? Well, we um, will check all of your teeth, uh, take x-rays of your teeth, and children will get a fluoride varnish typically, and that really helps to protect your teeth and prevent decay. There's really no reason that children should have decay if they visit their dentist, um, have good oral hygiene at home, and then get that fluoride, fluoride varnish two times a year. And for people that don't have a personal dentist, I understand that Crider Health Center has just started a dental program. Could you talk about that and how we, you could get information? Yes, we did. Um, we opened our new location in St. Charles at 102 Compass Point, and we are a federally qualified health center, which means we're a public health entity, and we really are there to provide services to the underserved, so someone with Medicaid or someone without insurance, but we also accept other insurances as well. Well, thanks so much, Pam, for letting us know about a, a simple routine that can help us overall. Okay, thank you. Some people also consider a bronze tan to be a sign of good health, but who's responsible for making certain that tanning facilities operate properly? Director for St. Charles County's Division of Environmental Health and Protection, Ryan Tilley, takes us on an inspection to show us how his staff ensures safe and sanitary operations. Tanning equipment is defined as any device intended to induce skin tanning on any part of the body through the use of ultraviolet radiation. The department conducts routine inspections of these types of facilities in order to protect the public health, welfare, and safety of our residents. During an inspection, an environmental public health specialist reviews the facility on a 27-point inspection criteria. They want to look at three main primary um, functions of the facility. They look at physical conditions, uh, operation, and cleaning and maintenance. During review of the physical facility, an inspector looks for things such as easily cleanable materials, ventilation, lighting, identification labels on the tanning equipment, timer system working properly in the correct amount of time, tanning equipment below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the lamp protection. During review of cleaning and maintenance, an inspector will look at cleaning logs that every facility must maintain, protective goggles are cleaned after each use, EPA sanitizer is being used, uh, defective lamps, and towels used only once and then properly cleaned and sanitized. During review of operation, an inspector looks for the consumer information form, consent form for minors, records of any injuries, and warning signs that are legible and clearly visible. Every establishment must pass an annual inspection. So that means that every year an inspector goes out and reviews that facility Tanning salon inspections do not get a score. They're reviewed on a pass-fail system, which means if they have one violation, then we have to come back and do a follow-up inspection to make sure that got corrected. If someone would like to report a concern about the cleanliness of a tanning salon, all they have to do is first speak with the owner or the manager of the facility. If they can't get a resolve there, then they can call our department. In order to call our department, you could either look at the signage in the facility. They should have it posted what our uh, phone number is. Alternatively, they can go to our website and they can email us or they can find our phone number there. Our phone number is 636-949-1800. Thanks to you and your staff, Ryan. After this short break, we'll discover a few questions you should ask your doctor and where to take your dog for an afternoon of fun. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds.
Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know Tara cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on the sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys Did know? you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine. This new mom is struggling to get the skates just right. And now she's holding on for dear life. Her kids can see she may have broke her knees. They still love her, though she looks like she's attacked by killer bees. I'm allergic. Proof you don't have to be perfect to be the perfect parent. Thousands of siblings in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to Safe and Sound. I'm your host, Doug Bolnick. On today's episode, we're learning about ways our community helps to make things better. One organization interested in making communication between doctors and patients better is Health Literacy Missouri. To give us an understanding of the mission of this organization is President and CEO of Health Literacy Missouri, Katina O'Leary. Katina, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Many of us recognize that literacy is being able to read, but what is health literacy? So health literacy takes some of those same components of literacy, being able to read, um, but expands them a little bit into being able to process and understand information. So when people are in the medical setting, whether it's at a hospital or a doctor's office, or even reading information on a prescription or um, trying to understand health insurance, they have to process a whole bunch of information to know what they need to do. And health literacy is the tools that help them do that, whether it's from a patient perspective of um, making sure they know what they need to know and how to understand information, or from a provider perspective and helping the doctors, um, the insurance companies, other people understand how to make insurance information more clear. So health literacy is kind of that gap between what the patient needs and what the provider needs to have a good conversation. And you work for, with the organization called Health Literacy Missouri, and you mentioned that there's both a, a part of the public and about the providers. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do for both of those? Sure. So from a, from a kind of public, people on the street perspective, um, things that people need to really understand are, um, you know, there are a set of requirements in the medical system. Um, physicians, providers, people tell you what they think you need to know, but they don't always understand exactly what you need to know and what you don't know. So your job as a patient is to really come in um, very comfortable and calm and have questions ready and be ready to um, ask questions even when somebody doesn't maybe put you in a position to ask questions. So sometimes at the end of a visit you'll see somebody say, okay, well do you have any questions as they walk out the door? And from a patient perspective you need to say, yeah, I do. I have one question right now. Um, you gave me this piece of paper, but gosh, this doesn't really make sense given what we just said. So what am I supposed to do? So we teach patients to feel comfortable like that. Most of our work though is with providers. So we talk with providers about what they do um, to kind of eliminate a patient's experience and ability to do that thing that we want them to do. Um, so we talk to them about how they speak clearly, how they write clearly, um, really simple strategies that they do to check understanding. So at the end of a visit they should say something like, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking. Um, can you just help me understand that I've, I've said things in a really clear way? What did we talk about today? And why is it important for you to know what your doctor's telling you? Well, we want people to do it. So you see in the news a lot of information about hospital readmissions and, and what, that mat what that matters, the kind of cost of the system. Um, one of the things we say in health literacy is, you know, part of the reason that people maybe don't do what they're supposed to is they didn't know what it was to begin with. So if we can make sure that they walk out the door and they know exactly what they're supposed to do, that they fill this prescription and they take it twice a day with breakfast and with dinner, um, the likelihood that they get better in the way that they're supposed to is high. Um, if they don't do those things, it's pretty likely that they're going to show up at the door again and maybe go back to the hospital. And do you have some suggestions for what a nurse or a doctor can do to help make sure that that happens? Sure. So some really simple things that we train providers to do is um, really start from where the patient is. 
So there's all kinds of stuff that, that providers know because they've been to medical school or nursing school or whatever. Um, a lot of that stuff doesn't matter to the patients. Patients don't care about the Latin names and why this happened and all the combinations of other complications. They really want to know what they're supposed to do. So if providers can explain really clearly the action steps for patients, um, if they can maybe draw some pictures, if they can um, use really clear um, words, you know, step one, fill the prescription. Step two, take the medicine at breakfast. Step three, take the medicine at dinner. Um, if, you can, if you can explain those things in a really simple way, um, people are more likely to do them. And then, as I said, I talked about teach back earlier, this idea that you assess comprehension and understanding before people leave so you know that they have the information. And if somebody was interested in learning more about what you do, how could they get more information? Oh gosh, they can find us on the internet. Um, there's all kinds of information at our website. Um, give us a call, come see us. We would love to talk about it. Thanks so much, Katina. Sure. It's great to know that it's sometimes okay to ask a question. Absolutely, thank you. Public dog parks are growing in popularity for both pets and their owners. But improper etiquette and failure to follow posted rules can ruin the experience. Nancy Gomer from St. Charles County's Parks Department suggests a few tips for getting the most out of a day in the park. You know, having an off-leash dog area in the community or a dog park is really beneficial. It's a beautiful open green space that dogs and citizens can come and enjoy. Upon entering an off-leash dog area, you should look for the posted rules and regulations. That is very important that these facilities have rules and regulations. You should also make sure that there is somebody who, like park rangers, are visiting the area frequently to make sure that people are abiding by the rules. First and foremost, before entering an off-leash dog area, you should have your animal properly immunized and they should be registered through the county. You need to be a responsible pet owner before you even enter an off-leash dog area. While you're in the off-leash dog area, make sure that um, you are paying attention to what your dog is doing. There's several different kinds and types of play, but if your dog is acting aggressively, you need to immediately take your dog out of the facility at no time do we want aggressive animals inside an off-leash dog area. They are not permitted. So if your dog has aggressive tendencies, then you need not bring them to the dog park. St. Charles County does offer citizens and their dogs a place to come and enjoy two off-leash dog areas. One is at Bromelsick Park, and that is in the Wentzville Defiance area. It recently was expanded to five acres. It's a beautiful space for your dog to come out and play. There's a small pond with a dock that dogs love to jump off of while their owners throw a ball or a frisbee. And there's a large shelter in the middle of the park with seating for uh, dog owners to watch their pet if they'd like to sit down. Our second off-leash dog area is located at Quail Ridge Park, and that is also in the Wentzville area. It is one and a half acres large. It has two separate areas, one for the smaller dogs, another for the larger animals, and there is a shelter as well with seating. If you're interested in coming by a St. Charles County off-leash dog area, you can visit our website and find out more about our rules and regulations and where they're located. Our website address is www.stccparks.org or you can call us and we'd love to answer any questions you might have. Our number is 636-949-7535. Thanks for the tips, Nancy. We've discussed a number of ways to make our community and our lives better on this episode. But that's all the time we have for today. Please join us next time to learn new ways to help keep your family safe and sound. Music